In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Blessed Feast of the Transfiguration. So, many times, uh, I was just talking to Abuna upstairs about how this feast is one of the feasts that is the most forgotten about. The most forgotten feast. Because it's during, it's always August 19th, which is always during the fast of St. Mary's. And if you noticed, the focus of the Transfiguration is one of these, it's, it's one of the feasts that is one of the most important feasts in our church, but it's also the most forgotten. And so today we're going to talk about what the Transfiguration is, why is it a big deal, and why it relates to me. Like, why is this a big deal? Not just historical that this happened 2,000 years ago. It was a really cool event. But that this has a, this has a deep meaning for my own uh, personal life. So when we look at the transfiguration, we don't have the icon here. They have it upstairs. But the icon of the transfiguration tells the story. Just like many icons, when you look at the icon, you can tell the, the full story of the, of the transfiguration. Where Christ took three of his disciples and took them to a mountain. Took them to a mountain. Now, throughout the, throughout the history of the Bible or in the stories in the Bible, we see something similar to this happening in, in different times. This concept of Christ taking somebody to the, the, the mountain in this, there's a purpose. There's a purpose for why Christ took three of his close disciples to the mountain. The transfiguration, the purpose of the transfiguration is that if we even break down the word, that it's transfigured. That means there's a change in a person's figure. In Christ, there was a change. He looked different. He looked different. He was very bright. He was white, even in uh, some versions of uh, uh, the Bible, it says that you can't even create this white. Like it's not, not even bleach could do this type of white. This concept of white, it's, it's a white that is not seen in the earth. So the transfiguration, the fathers talk about it as a window into heaven. That we look at Christ as who, who he is as a glorified body. In a different way, it's to look at the transfiguration is kind of the church telling you, hey guys, look, this is what your future looks like. This is what your future is like. This is the revelation of your future. Now in the transfiguration, we see the Trinity present. We see obviously the Son, right? That's easy. We see the Father through the voice. And the Fathers say that we see the, the Holy Spirit through the cloud and the light. And that's how the Holy Trinity is there. Now, I set the scene to show you what's happening like during that time. And then we obviously know that Moses and Elijah are also there. Now the question is, why? Why did Christ take them up to a mountain, take three of his closest friends, and up to a mountain to reveal himself? Why make it such a scene? Why not go deeper and, and spread, like, show everyone then? Why not? Why those three? And we have to look at it, how this affects us. How this affects us. So in our spiritual journey, in our spiritual journey, we always start with what? We start with the knowledge of. We, we start with rules, right? When we're younger, 
everybody, I mean, from a, from a young age, we, st we start with some sort of rules or structure. So for example, when, I'm, when I was a, a child, my parents gave me a structure on how to live a Christian life, right? You have to come to church, you have to uh, read from the Bible, you have to go to al Hain class, you have to, like, there's, there's, there's all these rules that were given from a young age. And that's how God worked with his people too. We see Moses here, and the concept of Moses here is to remind us that God didn't come to disobey the law, but he came to fulfill the law. So back then, the people had it in their mind. No. Moses, I follow Moses' law. Who are you? Even the Pharisees told Christ. He said, who are you? Why, why is this a big deal? Like, we follow Moses' law. Anything outside of Moses' law is wrong. That's why the Pharisees and the Jews at the time, they didn't like Christ. Because he was fulfilling the law. He was taking the law to another level. Many people looked at it as he broke the laws. Christ didn't break the laws. Christ fulfilled the law. So just like in, in, in our lives, we start with structure. Many of us, or many of you, start school this week, or last week, or next week, like this in, in these couple of weeks, right? The first thing that's going to happen, spoiler alert, the first thing that's, that's going to happen in any class is you're going to get a set of rules. You're going to get a, a, a structure. Sometimes it's called a syllabus. Sometimes it's called like a code of conduct, like behavioral thing, whatever. There is a set, there's a structure that it's, that's established that you know. You know that you can't miss class. You know that, it, like the exams, this is how much they weigh, right? Like this percentage and, and all this stuff. And what is expected of you? God started the same way. Also on a mountain, in Mount Sinai, he met with Moses and he gave Moses the laws for us. And that's how we start. Anything in life, we start with a set of like rules and regulations and laws, everything. When you go buy a car, the amount of the contracts that you have to read and this and that. When you buy a house, same thing. You, everything has guidelines and structure. Now, in our Christian life, it's the same way. We always start with the rules. We have to start with the rules. And then we grow. The second aspect is relationships. So the first thing, the rules are, the, the rules that God set for us is the rules in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the Levitical law, all the laws that he spoke, because it's not just the Ten Commandments. Many of us think that the rules that God spoke was the Ten Commandments. If anybody reads, hopefully we all read the, the Old Testament. If you look at Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, it's all a set of rules. It's very detailed rules. Don't do this. If you're going to do this, you can't be on this day. Don't do this. Eat this. Don't eat this. It's a set of rules. Now here's what happened. God started us off with rules to create a foundation. God starts us off with rules to set groundwork. I'll speak for myself. When I lack stru structure, that's when I'm on my lowest stage. When I lack some sort of order or an outline in my life, that's when I struggle the most. Because without a structure, things are just kind of all over the place. Things are just kind of like, if we think about even our spiritual lives during the school year versus during the summer. Other than competition, we don't have much structure. But the idea is that God starts us off with structure 
and build us up. The second thing is relationships. If you notice, when Christ came, when God became man, He's now, He came for the salvation of man, to relate to man, to bless man's nature. If you notice, He didn't come and stand at a mountain. What did He do? He entered into the lives of the people. He was born in a manger. It wasn't in a manger in a random place. No, within, uh, within a city, surrounded by loved ones. Surrounded by people. And then continued. Why, many people will ask, why did Christ need the disciples? If you think about it, did he need them? It's God. Did God need the disciples? It's we who needed Christ. So he picked a team. He created, he assembled a group of people to show us that in Christ, there is an importance in relationships. That it's not a one-man show. God wanted us to relate to him and to understand relationships through him. So, like we said, as we grow, when you're younger, you have rules. As you grow, one of the most important things is relationships. And the church focuses on that in a, in a very strong point with the idea of the father of confession. The father of confession. It, it, it Sometimes we take it and we say, no, the Father Confession is, is somebody that I just go and, and confess to and I leave. But the church calls it a Father of Confession because it's relational. It's relational. The same way we have a relationship with our earthly fathers, we have a relationship with our heavenly Father, we also have a relationship with our Fathers of Confession. That it's not just a set of rules that we're following but it's relational. There is discussion. Christ didn't have, like, they're not minions. They weren't people that worked for him. They weren't people that followed him out of fear. But they followed him out of love. He, uh, uh, a friend of mine, me and him were talking a while ago, and uh, I don't know, we were eating somewhere and we were talking, and and somebody made a joke. And, it was, and we were like, I don't know how it came up, but somebody said, do you think, do you think Christ had a sense of humor? Do you think Christ was a fun person to be around? And it's hard for us to think about that because that was 2,000 years ago and we weren't there. But if we really think about it, Everywhere he went, there was a huge crowd. Everybody wanted to be around him. You think about where he was invited to. He was invited to a wedding. He was invited to people's houses. He, he sat and ate with sinners, quote unquote. And I put him in quotes because everybody is a sinner. But he went to the people who were ignored by society. And they enjoyed his company. The people who were, people who, uh, were, were, were following God were close to him, like Lazarus, uh, Mary, and Martha were close to him. And then also the people who didn't have a relationship with God at all were close to him. So I believe he was a very relational man. He was a very relational, loving person. The Transfiguration teaches us that Christ focused on his relationships and wanted to reveal himself to those who he was closest to. Again, I go back to the original question. Why was the Transfiguration done the way it was? Why not in 
St. Mark's house, where he has his closest friends. No, he wanted to go deeper. In order for us to go deep with God, it's not enough to follow the rules. It's not enough to follow the rules. It's for us to have a relationship with him. And when we truly have a relationship with him, the same way Peter, John, and James do, he will reveal himself to us. I was talking to somebody that was saying, I keep going to church. I keep praying. I keep reading. But I don't feel God. And that's a hard thing to, to answer. Because you're doing the right things. You're praying. You're, you're coming to, to church. You're taking communion. Like you're doing all the right steps. So what's the problem? The problem is we cannot look at our relationship with God as a formula. As a formula. We can't look at, you know, one plus one equals two. We cannot look at our relationship because no other relationship is going to work like that. If you think about your friends, you can't say, oh, yeah, well, I text them today and I call them. uh, I'm going to call them in two days. And then I will see them in three days. What's the problem? Why aren't we close friends? Like we can't be robotic. In our relationship with God, it's the same way. It's a real relationship. And and he will reveal himself. He promised. He will reveal himself to us. When we look around, we see the saints. If you notice, many of the saints are live really tough lives. Like, we look around, it's really like a struggle. We see, we, we, we even call them the struggle bearers, right? Because they bared through struggle. They went through struggle in order to continue their relationship with God. That even struggle didn't stop them. Now let me ask you a question. Did these saints just follow rules? Saint Mo- Saint, uh, Moses the prophet was there at the transfiguration. And so was Elijah. To show us two main things. Obviously, there's many things that the fathers say. But one of the things that stand out is that to reveal to Peter, James, and John that By them following Christ, they're not ignoring the laws. That Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And that's very important to to really understand and to see. When we look at um, our relationship with Christ, we said we start with rules. Rules are important. And sometimes, I'll tell you, sometimes when we start with rules, and we enter relationship, we start forgetting about the rules. It doesn't work that way. Moses was there during the the transfiguration of Christ to show us that the rules are not neglected the closer we get to God. I know some people that will be so strict in their fast, so strict in their fast, and then as they grow, they start thinking, no, well, God, God doesn't really care about if there's milk products in the, the, the cookies, or God doesn't really care about, like, so what, I forgot to order it without cheese, like, God doesn't care about the cheese that goes on the thing, but that's, now we're taking our relationship with God, And having it affect the rules. Does that make sense? Like we're we're taking his relationship and we're using it to our advantage. And we say, no, God doesn't care about that. We 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 are experts in what God cares about and what God doesn't care about. But the idea is to to continue in order for us 
Our goal in this story is two things. One is to continue to connect to the glorified God so that we can be glorified as well. Because this is, like I said, this is our future. The transfiguration is an image of our future. So that's our goal. This gospel reading today and tomorrow is the goal of every Christian. And the second thing is to be like Peter, John, and James. That I want to be asked to go deeper with Christ. Like I want to go to a place where no one can go to. I want to build my relationship with God to a place where I'm going to be seeing something that it's only for me. You know, I, I had a chance to meet with um, a monk by the name of Father Lazarus in uh, St. Anthony's Monastery in, uh, in Egypt. And it was, a, it was a really, like, amazing time, like, thank God. And this was about nine years ago. And when I was out there with him, it was me and a friend, and we prayed liturgy with him. And then afterwards, we sat and we talked. And I had just heard so many stories about him. And I had a question that I really, it was really important for me to ask. And it was like, it was a partially jealous question. It was the idea of how come you're able to, and others like you, have a relationship with the saints. You know those people who speak about the saints in a way where you're just like, like I know of that saint, but they have a relationship with that saint. They're, they're like this with that saint. Like St. Pope Corollos and St. Mina. They were like best friends. Or Tamav Irini and Abu Sufyan. Like, they go hand in hand. And I asked him, how do you build a relationship with the saints? And he said, you first build a relationship with Christ. If your relationship with Christ is strong enough, others who are like you, he's like, sometimes we put the saints at a different level, an unreachable level. No, but they're just like us. They were born just like us. They had temptations just like us. They had struggles just like us, and sometimes even worse. But they continued in their relationship with God. So basically, our relationship with the saints is saying, we have one thing in common, and that's Christ. Let's help each other get there. And these are people who won the race already. So why not ask them for advice or help to get us through? And, and in this fast, we celebrate St. Mary, who is our intercessor but that she intercedes for us that we may reach the transfiguration. That's the goal of St. Mary. And the idea is when we start off with rules, Abuna Anthony spoke about the fear of God and what the fear of God is. The fear of God, he said, is not being scared of God, but it's loving God so much that we don't want to disappoint him, that we're in awe of God, so we're in fearful. And he gave the examples of the, the, the police, that we follow the rules so we don't get a ticket. But it's not just following rules, it's building a relationship. I want to just show you the last thing I'm going to say. So we, saw, we talked about the rules, and now the relationship. Lastly, we see the importance of the depth in Christ, going deeper in Christ. So we saw how the relationship, Christ brought his three closest friends up on a mountain. I, I was really thinking about why at the top of a mountain. Why was Christ so 
Why was it important for him to go all the way to the top of the mountain? And this is not a small mountain. This is a huge mountain. It takes you forever to drive up. So I can't even imagine how long it took with like no stairs and just kind of going up the mountain. And they get to the top. And they're tired. What happened when they, when they got up there? They slept. So God picked three people who were close to him that he was telling them basically like, all right, you guys, I want to take you guys. I'm going to show you something really amazing. I'm going to show you your future. Like, I'm sure they were excited when they started up the mountain. I'm sure they were. I'm sure everybody's going to get excited about your first homework assignment. You're going, to be, you're going to be at the top of your game. The first exam, the first test, the first paper, the first, everything you're going to, you're, you're, you want to be all the way at the top. What happens by mid-October, November, Christmas break, forget it. Like, we start losing that excitement. We start, we start now a different phase in our assignments where we start doing calculations. What do I need in order to get X? What do I need in order to get an A? What do I need in order to pass? What, I, like the standards and the standards keep dropping. We do the same in our spiritual life. In our spiritual life, we do the same. The harder it gets, the harder it gets, the more we start settling. We start saying, I'm not going to fast the entire fast. Or I'm not going to read every day. Or I'm not going to take communion every chance I get. It's too tiring. I'm too tired. God will understand. And he took these three to the top of the mountain. And I believe they were excited in the beginning. Because just a, a couple of chapters before, St. Peter is the one who said, you are Christ, the son of the living God, when they asked him who he was. And he's like, okay, you, you're coming with me. I'm going to show you. You've, you've confessed. You've proclaimed who, you, who I am. I'm going to really show you who I am. And they went up and they fell asleep. How do you think Christ felt? Like Christ took them, handpicked them, and he gets there and they fell asleep. Once they get there and they fell asleep, they missed some of the glorification. They caught it. They've, they saw it. But they woke up in a panic. Peter woke up and said, Peter woke up and said, guys, like, well, uh, let's, let's, let's make a tabernacle. Like, it's good for us to be here. Like, uh, uh, we're awake, we're here. And he's telling them, you missed it. You missed the point. The same three were taken with him where? To Gethsemane. The idea was Christ wanted to show them his glory to show them his pain, that there is glory in the pain in Gethsemane. And again, they fell asleep. They fell asleep. What I want to say is in our growth with God, as we start with rules, and then we go into our own personal relationship with Christ, and then we go deeper with Christ, it's not going to be easy. If you stay at rules, it's easy. But you'll be missing the, the, the glory. If you stay at relationship, the level of relationship is important to, to, to define. That we need to be go deeper. Do you want to be an acquaintance with God like the rest of the disciples? Or you want to have a personal 
close relationship with God like those three. And we have to remember that it will be hard. It will be hard. But that's why the church put in front of us the fasting, the prayer, the fathers of confession, and all these steps so that we can work on our own spiritual stamina as we continue. And glory be to God forever. Amen.